Welcome to the Be Well program. My name is Dr. Ted Bender. I am a clinical psychologist and the CEO of the Be Well Network. If you or a loved one is struggling, please visit BeWellRecovery.com. Our number is 866-317-8395. Today, I'm extremely pleased to interview and welcome actress and sobriety advocate, Natanya Ross. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Natanya, you are one of the most notable child actresses from the 90s. Some role is in Boy Meets World, Nickelodeon's The Secret World of Alex Mack, Beverly Hills 90210, which was one of my favorites back in the day. <laughs> me too. Little Monsters, Babysitter's Club, and much more. You're still an actress today, but you're also an active, you're also very active in the field of mental health and substance abuse. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a duality in my life that's really interesting to have one foot in this crazy entertainment industry and then my other foot in, you know, advocacy and sobriety and mental health. And um, yeah, I've been working in treatment for about 15 years and I just kind of rolled into it because I was a kid who had been in treatment so many times. And I think because I had such an ability to empathize and relate with other people that were struggling with what I had been through, it was kind of an easy transition for me. Yeah. You know, I've found in, in my experience working in the industry, you, you really need that duality. You need people that have gone through it themselves yeah. and are literally living, walking, breathing examples of what recovery can look like. That's right. And yeah. then you also need those people who have you know done the schooling and the psychiatrists and the doctors who yeah. are trained to treat the illness yeah. and the disease of addiction. Yeah. It's a really interesting kind of yin and yang yeah. of like the treatment professionals, you know, because I'm definitely not um, somebody who has letters after my name, but I have that like street school that I went through. So when people call me and they're struggling and they have no idea how they're going to get out of how they're feeling right at that moment, I'm like literally able to tell them from a truthful perspective that there is hope and there's a way out. Absolutely. In your 20s, you actually experienced homelessness yeah. because of problems with the drugs and addiction. Yeah. So you led you led this very, very successful child yeah. actor lifestyle, yeah. exposed to the, all Hollywood, all the glitz and glamour of that. Yeah. And then something kind of happened and there was a shift. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So um, I have kind of a crazy story. I started acting at six months old. Wow. So I know so many people ask me like, you know, did you like it when you started acting? I mean, I have no idea. You know, I I have no idea if I had, would even have wanted to get into that, right? Were you a Gerber baby? I was, it, actually. Really? <laughs> I was. So, yeah, by the time I was, like, I don't know, four or five, I had done 30 national commercials. Wow. And uh, we were in New Jersey still. And then I did this film, Little Monsters, which is so funny. I still, people still talk to me about it to this day. But I was, like, four years old, and wow. I had 30 seconds on screen, and... I think people were just like recognizing that I had some sort of a natural talent. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, we made the decision to move out to LA when I was eight years old. I had booked my first television show. And uh, by the time I was like that, that part of your brain that's forming that can like really understand what's going on in the world around you. Mm -hmm. I was already a very successful working child actor, sole breadwinner of the family, wow. a lot of pressure on my shoulders. Um, a lot of like, uh, stuff going on in the household behind the scenes mm -hmm. that, um, acting was like an escape for me, you know, like I could go play different people hmm. and I didn't necessarily have to like face the reality of what my life was looking like behind closed doors. So, yeah, I mean, in my teenage years, it was just, um, it was crazy. Young Hollywood in the nineties at that time was wild and yeah. there wasn't a lot of cameras around. There was no social media. We were kind of just set free. And we were like young, famous, rich. And uh, I fell into things I shouldn't have fallen into. And there's, I don't think at that age there's any way to like really recognize early onset alcoholism or drug addiction, yeah. right? But um, a lot of it is circumstantial. I definitely started hanging out with the wrong people. So everything that had been working for me up until that point, meaning substances that I had found that were still pretty maintainable, but enough to make me like find that breath mm -hmm. in life. When I started finding harder and harder substances, um, by the time I was 20, my, uh, my, my desire to be able to not have to be me overcame my work ethic and my desire to like continue 
to strive towards an even more successful career. And that's just kind of how it went for me. The, the need for escape yeah. began to trump the need for 100%. professional. 100%. Yeah. Huh, interesting. Yeah. And why why was that need so strong? Like, what, what were you trying to escape from or what were you running from? Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. You know, I think that I was just kind of built a little bit different mm -hmm. than a lot of people. Um, at a really early age, I remember I would, like, feel so heartbroken all the time and I had no idea what it meant huh. and um, in that time too mental health was not like yes. as easily discussed as it is today um, and when you're a successful working child actor there's not a lot of time to like pull you away from that to like really figure out what's going on with your mental health right so why did I get into such hard drugs it's it's I'm not like a hundred percent sure. I just think I was pre-wired for that. Hmm. And um, I think I would have found it no matter what. I just found it really effing early, part, <laughs> in, part of my language. Um, but for me, what it provided was like, um, uh, you know, I, I talk about it. It's like this thing in my brain that just goes and goes and goes no matter what, right? And it hmm. says all sorts of really evil um horrible berating things to me and it speaks to me in a voice that sounds exactly like my own mm -hmm. so it's really hard not to believe it and not to buy into it so when i found heroin and opioids and other drugs it quieted that voice long enough for me to go <sighs> take a breath yeah. yeah did did that voice that you mentioned start earlier on before the drugs and alcohol did you start <laughs> hearing that yeah i mean first of all it's a it's an intricate complicated layered thing to go through puberty on television yeah, right? right i mean it's, um, everybody's watching you grow up. Everybody's watching you. <laughs> it took me a little late to bloom. So I wasn't like the cute, hot, pretty girl that like boys wanted to talk to. Mm -hmm. And I tended to play a lot, especially on Alex Mack, which was, you know, kind of my showpiece, mm -hmm. so to speak, um, that I was on throughout all my teenage years. It, it took me a while to bloom, yeah. you know, and I, I tended to play characters that were a little gothic or like the bad girl, mm -hmm. you know, and I was so desperate to be like, <clears throat> I wanted to be the beautiful one or all gotcha. that. And it just wasn't, you know, so I think that voice started really early on. It started, Hollywood told me that I was this thing huh. and that I could never be this thing, you know, and I think that I really wanted to rebel against that. So I just like fully, I was like, all right, you want me to be a bad girl? I'm going to. I'm going to be a bad girl. Interesting. Yeah. Psychologist me can't help but to start to formulate a picture here, right? Please do. <laughs> Young child actress, extremely talented, yeah. never good enough, and the voice is always yeah. there, wanting to be a different type. Yeah. And then the voice gets louder and louder, and eventually, usually, and the, the typical um, drug pathway in the 90s was alcohol and marijuana. Yeah. It's different these days. Yeah. But then, like you said, you know, you found the alcohol or, or whatever the drugs were early on as a way to escape and yeah. take a breath. Yeah. And honestly, when I started drink, I started drinking really, really young. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, a couple drinks in and all of a sudden I was beautiful. Right. There goes right? the anxiety, right? Yeah. The I was cool. Mm -hmm. I was as good enough as everybody else was. And all of a sudden boys did start to like me and it provided for me a comfort that I, I couldn't provide for myself. Yeah. You know, it seems like the answer. It seems like the answer. And I was a Nickelodeon time. kid, you know, and yeah. there's a lot of pressure with that. There's an expectation mm -hmm. that you behave, um, properly in the public eye. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Nickelodeon is the number one kids network. And right. we were like, I think the number one kid show for five years straight. Yeah. And so, the, yeah, there was a lot of pressure on me. But like behind the scenes, uh, my home life was really bad. Mm. My family, it was everything was falling apart. There was a lot of gnarly, gnarly alcoholism going on yeah. in my own household. So this was kind of, you know, what I was looking around at and, and my influences and I mean, this is a story for another time, but my parents had an open marriage at one point, uh -huh. and I was watching all of these things develop in front of my eyes at 13, 14 years old, and trying to, like, navigate and figure out how how to cope with that, and I think that's when I started to develop, like, a very skilled way of compartmentalizing huh. everything, and then when I could drink, none of it mattered. 
I think you know for our viewers out there that can I think a lot of people can really relate to what you're saying. You know, we're seeing a picture here of a genetic familial link mm -hmm. towards addiction and and um, and alcoholism. Yeah. Um, and then, as many young teens do, they find that that first time experimenting with alcohol or marijuana are these days, unfortunately, street yeah. pills and oxycodone. It's horrible. Yeah, it takes away that pain. And when we don't really know what the dangers are or the risks are at the time it seems like you found the answer. We yeah. found the cure. Yeah. Unfortunately, with addiction, um, it doesn't stop there. You need more and more of it to get to that same high or that same level. You need harder and harder drugs to get to that same level of relief or that breath yeah. that you've mentioned. And that yeah. is often the pathway that yeah. is taken. Yeah. So that's fascinating. So, um, so you were extremely successful on television. It was your escape. You found your way out from the, the, the home life problems. Yeah. A lot of pressure on you because like you said, you were the breadwinner. You were the one bringing in, bringing in all the money, yeah. um, which I'm sure, you know, the f family was really loving at the time. Very much <laughs> so, sure. yeah. And, and yeah, at the same time, you know, you're, you're a kid, you know, you're not yeah. in school normally. You not know, normal you, school. You got tutors probably, something like yeah, that. Yeah, all of that. And you're going home and you're being exposed to all of this kind of traumatic, you know, alcoholism mm -hmm. and, and marital discord and all of these yeah. things. Uh, and I can, I, can see, I can see how the picture really began for yeah. you at that point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've always just kind of done the best I can to mm -hmm. get through things, you know, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess in a way I'm grateful that I had um, alcohol and other substances back then. I don't know that I would have like made it through that time period without. Mm -hmm. um, I just didn't know how deep down the hole it was going to take me. Yeah. I mean, how are you going to know that as a kid? No. How are you gonna, how do you're you know just partying with your friends. <laughs> you're just like at clubs in Hollywood and... Yeah. And it's cool and it's hip and it's yeah. chic and it's all of these things, right? And um, no one says that, like, th if you don't cut this out now... It's going to be a problem. Yeah, you're going to battle this for the next two decades of your life. Like, who, a 16-year-old wouldn't even know what to make with that. It's scarier now, don't you think? I mean, you work in the addiction yeah. industry now. When when I was a kid and when you were a kid, experimenting was a little bit of weed and some alcohol from your yeah. your, your friends. Maybe like a little bit of cocaine cabin. every so often, right. but it was not. Yeah, I mean, I'm grateful I'm not a kid today. Right. With the predisposition that I have to mm -hmm. alcoholism and addiction, I would definitely be dead. It is a very scary, scary world yeah. today. So, um, yeah, I can't. I, I don't. It's it's heartbreaking. It's. Yeah, it's bad. These days, you know, experimenting, uh, a lot of kids are now experimenting with pills. Mm -hmm. And what a lot of people don't know is that these pills are repressed on the street. Mm -hmm. They're not prescription pills from ph legitimate pharmacies. And they're being laced with a drug called fentanyl. Yeah. And fentanyl is one of the most powerful, deadly drugs on the market, and it has flooded the streets of the United States from, from China and Mexico. And you just don't know if the drugs you're doing are going to have fentanyl in it. And even a very small dosage is enough to kill you. Yeah. We lost 102,000 American lives to drug overdose in the last 12 months. Wow. So that's when I talk about, you know, experimenting today is not the same as it was, you know, when no, we were kids. That's absolutely not. I mean, you said it beautifully it's it, well it's an epidemic that's going on and um it is just not it's not a safe world we're in right now yeah. on so many levels but yeah. it is not a safe world um for these kids that are growing up that um you know their friend at school ha got a couple pills and i'm like let's do this after mm -hmm. school and party and like yeah i've had a lot of friends that have um overdosed yeah you know, from fentanyl specifically, uh -huh. I know a lot of people. I mean, I feel like every other day I'm hearing something, and it's scary. Yes, it's scary. So I'm curious to hear more about the how things progress. So at some point, you you realize, or you, so that you're you're working as a child actress. At some point, that slows down a bit. Yeah. So um, I really try to <laughs> maintain to the best I could. Uh -huh. But I start showing up to auditions high right. um, or sick, uh -huh. um, bruised up from track marks, uh -huh. um, and cocky and arrogant, thinking uh -huh. that I had made, like, you know, my impact that I've made on this 90s decade of pop culture. Uh -huh. Like, I can show up however I want, and uh, that is not how it goes down. Right. 
So, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of, one of my very last huge auditions, I really blew it. And I, sh I showed up, I was nervous, so yeah. I got high before and I showed up. And by the time I got home, my representation that I had had for almost 20 years all dropped me at once. Oh, wow. Not one of them offered to help except for my manager at that time, Beverly Strong. I'll mm. always say her name because I never forgot that. And I just wasn't ready, uh -huh. you know, but she offered to help me. She had pretty much had a hand in raising me as a kid. Yeah. And all of these people did. And that's kind of the that's kind of the danger of Hollywood, too, is that you make people so much money for so long and then all of the effects of Hollywood that are long lasting still to this day, believe me, um, you know, you now are the one that is in trouble and not a lot of people step in to help. Interesting. Yeah. It's very kind of cutthroat that way. It's very, it can be very cutthroat, mm -hmm. but there's also some angels that, you know, um, understand and, and, but I, at that time I wasn't ready for the help. So I think because that happened, that was it for me. I was like, I can deep dive into this addiction now. Um, I still had a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. uh, my boyfriend at the time was a successful actor who also had money. We were, you know, traveling around doing these signings and stuff like that. And we had enough to support our habit mm -hmm. until um, until one day we didn't. Right. You know? And then you wake up that day and you kind of look around at your life and you're like, what, ha what just happened? How old were you at that point? So I was probably <clears throat> around 20 years old at that point when I was really... Um, strung out, which means my body was now phys you know, but yeah. just for anyone watching, right. it means my body was physically addicted. Um, I was mentally addicted. I was spiritually addicted. And the only joy I had in my life was this drug that I was putting in my body every day. Um, and it, and it was, I was maintaining a numbness well enough that like I hadn't really properly grieved the fact that I just had lost a 20 year, mm -hmm. very successful career. Um, so that was it for me. And we, you know, we did the best we could for a few years. And by the time I knew it, um, we had nothing. So my life had been this like huge, big, beautiful thing. And then by 22 years old, um, I was living in a car, you know, and just kind of like doing what I could to maintain my habit mm -hmm. and maintain any semblance of, um, sanity that I could, which is very hard when you come from what I had to now like living in a car. What a roller coaster. Uh, it was insane. How was your family relationship at that point? Horrible. Were, you talk were we talking to them at all? Horrible. Or, yeah. yeah. My mom and I have always had a, a difficult yeah. relationship. And I think by the time I had like thrown away this career that she felt that she had helped cultivate, right. um, you know, I, I think there was like a level of disgust with what I had done. Mm -hmm. And um, so we were very estranged and there was some financial complications mm -hmm. between her and I, because when I turned 18, there was stuff that was oh, owed yeah. to me. Yeah. And um, in hindsight, thank God, I would have killed myself with it, right? But mm. um, so incredibly difficult. I had nothing at that time except for like this car, that boy and this drug. Um, and um, everybody in my life had they had to walk away from me. Yeah, they had to. They had no choice, and I understood that. You know. So there comes a point where you realize now that something needs to change. Yeah. Right. And and I believe you said that was mid twenties at some point. What what happened around there? What was yeah. that? Did you have that one moment, or was it a bunch of little moments? It was a bunch of little the moments. The aha moment. Yeah, there was a few. <laughs> so, um, you know, I had tried my hand at rehab a couple times. Mm -hmm. Um. My mom did step in at one point and put me in treatment, um, and it, it was just like an unsuccessful attempt, unfortunately. I went right back to what I was doing. Right. And then from the car, we actually ended up moving downtown L.A., mm -hmm. so right off Skid Row, 3rd and Alameda. So imagine, like, um, I wake up in a car, and I'm looking around at my life, like, what the F happened? Mm -hmm. You know, you wake up downtown L.A. Um, I don't know that there's, like, much worse, you know, for someone like me that you can get. And uh, so, yeah, I we survived those years downtown, thank God, somehow. And again, I went back to rehab. And this time, instead of going back to the people I had been with in my addiction, I came back to the San Fernando Valley. Shout uh -huh. out 818, <laughs> my safe place, my home. And, um, and I just did things a little bit differently. Uh -huh. um, however, I was still drinking. So yeah. my aha moment was... Um, 
I really just wanted to figure out, like, if I can figure out how to drink like a normal person, mm -hmm. right? Like, it talks about it in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, that, yeah. like, everybody would tip their hat off to me and be like, wow, she, like, conquered this rock bottom homeless heroin addiction, but now she can drink normally. Mm -hmm. And I wanted that so bad because, to me, I think I associated, like, drinking normally with... Um, Hollywood or I don't know. I mean, yeah. I don't know exactly what I associated it with, but obviously my brain still needed some sort of lubrication mm -hmm. in order just to survive. Right. So, um, I was drinking for a while and I actually ended up started dating somebody else who I dated when I was like 18 and mm -hmm. also 13. And, um, and he was a pretty gnarly alcoholic too. And mm -hmm. it also, um, abstained from heroin for a while. And, um, yeah, we were together for about a year and we drank like crazy people, mm -hmm. um, but it felt like protected and safe somehow because we weren't doing any drugs. And um, one night the fatal decision was made of let's, you know, fuck it, let's go get drugs. And we did. And he ended up dying in bed next to me. Oh, yeah, that's terrible. So for me, my, that's my aha moment. I'd like to say that I've stayed sober 100 percent mm -hmm. since then. I haven't. Um, but, uh, I think my life kind of like ended and began all in that moment. Sure. Right. So, um, I got sober right after that and I stayed sober for a long time. Um, but since that moment, I've never gone back to IV drug use. Yeah, good. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just, it's been a, an interesting ride for me, you know, it's been a really interesting ride. So I think that was like my biggest aha moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of what you're what you're saying is really making me think of um, some of the more common misconceptions mm -hmm. in addiction. One of them being that consequences keep people sober. Yeah, they really don't. But we we believe it in the moment. We convince ourselves that we're never going to use again because X, Y, or Z consequence. Are there any other misconceptions about addiction or addiction treatment or mental health that, that you see in your work that you'd like the viewers to know about? Uh, yeah, a lot of things. Number one being like. Um, you know, I thought you loved me. Why can't you just stop for me? Yes, that's a, that's a, that's good a big one, one right? A common one, yes. Or, um, yeah, that's a huge one. Or as far, I mean, I really like talking about the mental health piece too, because mm -hmm. I really believe, and what I'm seeing working in treatment too, is that there's always an underlying piece of mental health that hasn't been addressed when it comes to drug addiction, Agreed. especially in this day and age, right? The one that drives me crazy the most that I actually deal with in my own personal life is like, well, why are you depressed? Your life is so good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, it's called a mental health diagnosis. Right. There's no rhyme or reason to right. it. You know, uh, I had a therapist at one point tell me that she believed I had situational depression, which I still don't even fully understand to this mm -hmm. day, to be honest, and or seasonal depression, right? Like, I, I, there, are, there are days where I wake up and I can conquer the world. I am unstoppable. I'm leading with a heart of service. Mm -hmm. I'm helping put out fires. I'm answering every phone call. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of phone calls. Natanya, help me. Natanya, help me. Natanya, right? And I can handle it all. And then there's some days where I wake up and I'm like, I, I can't do it. I stand, but I can't move. I'm yeah. like catatonic, right? Or that anxiety that creeps up and it, it really upsets me when people are like, well, just don't be so anxious. Well, yeah. how, do, how do you do that? How do you do that? I, right? I've, been, I've been saying that for years. Telling someone with an anxiety disorder not to worry is just one of it's the horrible. dumbest things you can say to it's them. Horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. It's, it's so like, um, I don't know if this is a word, unvalidating mm -hmm. or, yeah. you know, it's, um, yeah. So I think there's so many misconceptions um, about drug addiction and mental health. I also think that people don't realize that just because you get a period of like physical sobriety, that if you don't have the emotional and spiritual sobriety mm -hmm. behind that, it, it's not going to be sustainable. And I've experienced this over and over and over and over mm -hmm. in my lifetime. I mean, I've had a lifetime battle with drug addiction. It is not still to this day. It's not always an easy thing, yeah. you know? And so, yeah, I think there are some misconceptions about um, that. And, and also, I think that people look so, people that don't understand, at least they look so down mm -hmm. on, um, on addiction. Yes. You know? Another one, and I'll I'll end with this one. Another one that drives me crazy is like, well, why can't you just have one drink? Yeah, you haven't done heroin in, you know, ten years. Why can't you just have one drink? 
well, you don't want to see me after <laughs> one drink, you know, I'll, God knows what's going to happen. So I think there are a lot of misconceptions. And I, and I think the saddest one probably is that if you admit it, mm -hmm. that you that you're automatically weak. When I was in college, before I got into this industry, uh, one of my close friends, a professional bodybuilder uh, I worked with at a restaurant, um, he was a recovering alcoholic, still is. And I asked him that exact question. I said, hey, you know, if you're just, you know, at a picnic, it's a hot summer day, and there's a cooler full of Heineken, how do you not just have one? Right. His answer literally is what led me into this business. Really? Yeah. Because he said, you know why, Ted? Because I won't just have one. I'll drink the first one, and then I'll drink the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and I'll keep drinking them until I vomit, and then I'll go to the liquor store and buy a bottle. And that just was like, whew, Yeah. That clicked for me. Yeah. That really helped me to understand the difference. Yeah. And a couple other things I wanted to point out to our listeners that you mentioned are so, so important. Depression, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, um, why don't you, can't you just try to not be so sad? Pick yeah. yourself up by the bootstraps, yeah. right? We've heard that before. Depression is not something that people choose to have. It's a debilitating condition that can literally take your life. And it is yeah. one of the biggest costs and drains on the healthcare system in the United States. And in being sad is just one symptom of depression. There are many others. It's the same thing with anxiety disorders. Telling someone with an anxiety disorder to just stop worrying so much yeah. is a ridiculous statement because they do not want to be worrying right. all day long about every little thing. It's debilitating and paralyzing. Yeah. It's an illness that, that actually does respond well to treatment, to good treatment. But with anxiety disorders, a lot of people are very nervous to go to treatment because of the nature of the illness. Um, so, I, And then the third thing I wanted to mention on that I think is really important is blaming the victim, right? Mm -hmm. we, we look down at people with addiction. We think that they're less than or bad people or all of them are living under a bridge downtown, as the <laughs> Chili Peppers used to say, right? right? But that's not the case. No. It affects all walks of life. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned it, you know, like, you know, how can you be so sad or how can you have any problems if you're a successful actress? Addiction doesn't care if you're a successful actress. It doesn't care about anything. It doesn't care. No. It's indiscriminate. Yeah. It can affect anybody. And the vast majority of people that develop substance use disorders have experienced some form of trauma yes. in their life. Yeah. So if you're looking at it that way, and if most people who have severe substance use disorders experience a severe trauma, then what are we doing besides blaming the victim? Yeah. And most people just can't see it that way. I, well, I wish everyone was like you because <laughs> I think we'd have a better success rate of, you know, long-term sustainable sobriety. But, you know, unfortunately, it's just not like that. And there's a lot of people struggling in this world right now. Well, like people like you coming on this show to talk mm -hmm. about that so openly is going to help that yeah. because it's the, so. it's the stigma. Yeah. Right. Addiction's bad. People who have addictions are evil, evil yeah. people. You're not an evil, evil person. You're a successful, highly successful person who's coming on openly sharing your story. Yeah. And that is very powerful. And very Thank helpful. you. I appreciate that. So let's switch topics a little bit. Yeah. Now you you are uh, you know we're working in the same industry. We are. So excited to meet you. I know. Me too. Um, you you've gotten a handle on your sobriety, but you said something very important. It's not a it's over and I'm sober and yeah. cured. It's a daily. I struggle right? all the time. So what are some things you can tell our listeners and viewers that have been helpful for you to maintain your sobriety? Yeah. So for me, I think my saving grace and my magic has always come from leading with a heart of service. You know, like the more I think about you, the less I think about me. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. Um, I have a tendency to just sit and think about myself all day, every day, mm -hmm. um, which is dangerous because that allows the ego to go to places that like we're just not supposed to experience as human beings. And I think that I'm um, I think that I'm at a little bit more of a risk to like live in that ego place as an alcoholic and an addict. I'm incredibly involved with charity work. Oh, That's been my um you know, I've done a lot of service work in 12 step and, and stuff like that. But also I think the longer, you know, I, technically I've been in AA since I'm 17. Yeah. I'm going to tell you guys I'm 40. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's what? 27, 23, 23, years, yeah. 23 mm -hmm. years in and out, in and out, just, you know, trying to figure out who I as, am as a human being. So I think for me in the last like 10 years where I've really found uh, what has helped me the most mm -hmm. is one, just being like a decent human being, 
right? There's so many ways to be of service. Mm -hmm. Like you can be of service to your friends. You can be of service to your partner. You can be of service to your family. There's, it's so vast. Um, so I try to just be like a kind human because I think we're really lacking that in mm. today's world. Agreed. And then I got very involved in charity work and my heart really lays with the homeless communities of Los Angeles. Mm. And I started a nonprofit about 10 years ago called San Fernando Valley Feed the Homeless, where um, it just started with me and a couple friends. We were looking around the valley saying like, damn, there's a lot of homeless people out here and everyone's so focused on downtown LA or Santa Monica or Venice. So mm -hmm. we just like raised a hundred bucks made a few sandwiches, drove around the valley and passed out the food and just were nice to people. And we took it from that to now 10 years later, I think we fed, I don't know, I mean, probably close to 60,000. I mean, wow, that's impressive. yeah, yeah. Uh, it, and it's, that was life changing for me and really like helped me understand the philanthropist part of like my human mm -hmm. being. Right. And then more recently, I got involved with a nonprofit called Hope of the Valley. And they're um, I mean, ugh, this organization is incredible. I could go on and on about them. But primarily where I got involved was the sector where they're building tiny home communities mm. to get people off the street and into the shelter of a tiny home. So for me, that is what has worked. Um, sometimes, I don't know, different days, different things work, mm -hmm. you know. Um, some days nothing works and yeah. I stay in bed and that's the truth. And I, I, I like that I'm the kind of person that's not afraid to say that out loud. Um, you know, I still have my insecurities. I still have my moments of like existential crisis. I still have the moments where I'm like, you know, um, is this acting thing ever going to really happen for me again? Mm -hmm. And I get very emotional, Woo, get emotional now. <laughs> I get very emotional when I think about that. Yeah. Um, you know, and, uh, yeah. And, and I also fall victim to, to the social media thing, uh -huh. right? I'll go on social media and everybody's lives look like exactly what I wished mine looked mm -hmm. like. Right. But like, that's all bullshit too, yeah. you know, because I go on there and my life probably looks <laughs> so amazing too. And like, you know, there are days where I'm posting in that place that we talked about where I'm like in bed and I can't like just everything hurts. Mm -hmm. You know, I love that you said, it's not just like a mental thing that we're dealing with when it comes to depression. It actually turns into like a physical oh, yeah. um, pain as well. Where like ev you just, it's it's such a, it's an indescribable feeling, and I don't think you you couldn't understand it unless you felt it. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's there's lots of things I do on a daily basis. Um, you know, I try and stay as connected to a power greater than myself as possible. Yeah. Um, you know, because I understand that, like, if I had taken a left turn at one point, you and I wouldn't even be sitting here right, right now. So there's got to be something that kept me here this long. And sometimes just that thought alone is enough to keep me going. That's excellent. There's you know? so much to unpackage there, too. Yeah. Um, so if I'm hearing you correctly, um, your involvement with AA, I'm assuming you have a sponsor and maybe even sponsoring others. Yeah, have had... I have a couple girls yeah. that I sponsor. Yeah. yeah. So that, that service work really helps. I'm an advocate, obviously, for 12-step. Um, you know, I have been through treatment mm -hmm. many times, and I also believe in treatment, too. I think that, that to get that period of, like, um, uh, to get days between you and a drug yeah. is super important in early sobriety, 100%. And, I, you know, I think that uh, the long, long, long-term sobriety that I've seen sustained mm -hmm. has mainly been through 12-step. Yeah. That's just my opinion, but my opinion is one of a million. I you found, know. you know, for, for patients that I've worked with, um, being in treatment is kind of like you're treating the you're treating the physical and mental and illness piece of it. Yes. And then getting that period of sobriety, letting your your brain function more mm -hmm. normally. But you're right. It's you know when you get out is when the real work begins. Absolutely. It's yeah. just a period of stabilization, yes. basically, right? Yeah. And then you're released back into this world mm -hmm. where it's like kind of do or die time yeah, no really one, no one's telling you to when to wake up anymore no, no. one's telling you to go to group no one's no they're not yeah. i'll tell you though some of my best habits i did learn in mm -hmm. rehab you know i wake up and i make my bed Routine. every day yeah. i keep my um i keep my house immaculate mm -hmm. i don't know if that's like a little bit of ocd or what <laughs> you know i think the longer 
the longer I stay sober, the older I get, the more, the, the less control I have over things that go on in the world. So the only thing I actually can control is my environment. Yeah. So I keep everything pristine because I will never forget the days that I lived in the back of a car yeah. with one backpack to my name with like barely anything in there, you know? You mentioned self-care too. And, mm-hmm. and, and to, to our listeners out there, again, you know, having days like that, where you just need to take it, take time for yourself yeah. and sometimes not even get out of bed. There is nothing wrong with There's that. There's nothing wrong no, with that. I, I do that myself. I, I totally. totally agree with that. If you need it, if your body and your mind are telling you you need yeah. it, take it. Yeah. There's always tomorrow. I do think there's a difference between those days and self-care days, though, mm-hmm. because, uh, you know, to me, the, those are like a mental health day. And mm-hmm. I'm not afraid to um, open my mouth and ask for help. And I've done it at work and yeah. said, hey, I just can't. I, I need I need a a break for a second. And then there's the, the self care days where you are really doing something that nurtures your soul. And self care can look like a thousand different things to a thousand different people. You know, for me, it's like a good spa, you know, a facial Mm -hmm. or something like that, or just, you know, watching whatever I want on television, allowing myself the time and space to not answer my phone that yeah. constantly Ringing rings yeah. over and over and over. <laughs> Sometimes for me, cleaning my house is self-care. Mm-hmm. Like, I love that, you know. My or, wife says the same thing. But yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, I'm sure my fiance appreciates that <laughs> those days as well. So, yeah, I mean, there's so many different ways to um, to look at it. But I think because I have so many pockets of my life that I have to nurture and um, help grow and develop that and I think when you're a, the kind of person that a lot of people lean on mm-hmm. you will crumble you know all of a sudden out of nowhere you're just like you just everything just like shuts down yeah, and, you that, know? and that got way worse during COVID way worse I mean when we look at the the needs in the healthcare system oh, mental yeah. health care the pressures yeah. that were put on doctors and nurses oh, and yeah. therapists yeah. were immense i was working in the hospital system during wow. the height of covid and i can tell you you know well we, thank you yeah. first of all thank you for that <laughs> what i was doing was nothing compared to what the nurses yeah. and the, the physicians and the medical techs yeah. were dealing with every single day on those units yeah. You know, I was working for a mental health company within the hospital system, and we had to shift gears during the pandemic to just focus on our own employees' right. mental health. You know, we completely right. shifted. Yeah, I think a lot it. of people forget, too. We just went through a global pandemic, and we're still going through it currently. Yeah. And um, I think it brought up a lot of stuff yes, for people did. that, like, it's okay that we talk about that. Like, I mean, even just on a physical level, I remember I gained 40 pounds mm-hmm. during the pandemic, and my body looked very um, foreign to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, I started to experience a little bit of social anxiety Mm -hmm. afterwards. And I've always been a very outgoing, non-introverted person. And now sometimes it, like, if I'm at an event or even a signing, I feel a little gun shy. I'm Mm -hmm. like, ah, it's too much stimulation for me, you know? And we, I think people need to give themselves a break and recognize that too. The the whole country's feeling what you just described. Yeah. The levels of anxiety and depression and trauma have spiked significantly. Yeah, definitely. And and you think about the pandemic too, um, when it comes to sobriety, what, there could not have been a more perfect condition for relapse. You have social isolation because no one could go anywhere. Yeah. Then you have economic downturn and people losing their jobs. One of the most stressful things that can happen to you. Now we're isolated. And we're broke. Yeah. And we're trying to stay sober at the same time. Yeah. Explosion. And perhaps our family members died or our, we yes. know people that a million people that are in the hospital and they can't get out because they're on breathing tubes. I mean, there was there was so much there that was like the perfect storm. Exactly. Yeah. So being in the entertainment industry now and, yeah. and you've had a long period of sobriety, you must be around a lot of alcohol <laughs> and use. You must be exposed. Yeah. How are you staying sober on a daily basis? What are like, what are your, your ha- daily habits that are helping you to get through that? Yeah. I mean, that's actually an interesting point to bring up um, because I don't think a lot of pe- people realize that I am actually around a lot of alcohol mm-hmm. at a lot of times. You know, I haven't had a drink of alcohol in probably, I think it's 13 years. Congratulations. Thank you, which is crazy, you know. And um, I'm not going to sit here and say that it's like a perfect thing. Mm -hmm. There are times where I'm with my peers in the entertainment industry and everybody is having so much fun. Mm -hmm. And it's this kind of wild, like crazy thing. And, um, And I'm like, damn, could I do that? But like for me, I think the risk of like, knowing that I really can't do that always 
outweighs the like desire to maybe try yeah. you know and like i said you got to get time away from the substance yeah right so like 13 mm -hmm. years away from alcohol is a long time for me to like i mean i'm i'm well suited to not get super tempted about that but if i'm ever struggling um <clears throat> i will remove myself from the situation okay, so number one remove yourself you can remove mm -hmm. yourself listen you could have 30 days sober or 13 years it doesn't matter you can remove yourself um and alcohol is not even my that's not even my thing right but if it ever starts to feel uncomfortable for me I remove myself from the situation. So you've also identified and really understand yeah. the trigger points. Yeah, and yeah. also I don't like give myself like, oh, you're so weak because after this long alcohol. No, who cares? Just leave, go home, go to bed. So, it's fine. So three, avoiding negative self-talk. Yeah, yeah, you avoid the negative self-talk. Mm -hmm. You understand that like, even though you have um, been, you know, granted the grace of not having had alcohol in over a decade, that like the brain is still wired yeah. to potentially um, be triggered by that and you remove yourself from the situation. I think for anybody new that that's experiencing uh, this deep struggle with like getting, like we said, those days in between mm -hmm. the drink and the abstinence, mm -hmm. uh, call somebody, Yeah. call somebody, talk to somebody. It's so hard to pick up that phone. It Believe is. me, I get it. I understand, I understand, I understand. Again, lifelong battle with addiction, right? pick up the phone and call somebody and talk to somebody that you trust. And that, that voice that says like, people don't want to hear that. Like you'll be a burden. No one cares. Uh -huh. Like people care. You're never a burden and they want to talk to you about it. Exactly. That's the truth. And use the tools that you have. If you're a part of a 12 step program, try and, I mean, now we're in a, a world of Zoom. Try and log on to a meeting. You mm -hmm. can go wherever you are. Go in person. If you have a sponsor, call the sponsor. You know, if it's like, if you're a couple days away from that, that like, oh, I know that feeling in the gut where you're mm. just like, I want to do it. I want to do it. I want to do it. Like, go do something for somebody else. Yeah. Right? So like I said. The charity work. Yeah. Yeah. The more I think about you, the less I think about me. Mm -hmm. And the less I think about me, the less I think about drinking. Right. That's the truth. So I think there are so many things that we can do to protect ourselves. Um, and, you know, recovery looks very different these days. We're in a progressive world and there's... Um, you know, thank God the conversation now includes therapeutic services too. Uh -huh. Maybe it means you schedule an appointment with your therapist, uh -huh. you know, uh, there's so many different ways that we can really like reach out and be there for each other. You heard Natanya say it and she hit it right on the head for, for all of those of you who are listening or watching this right now, if you're struggling, if you're in early recovery, if you're wondering what the next right thing is to do she gave you an excellent list and a blueprint, removing yourself from the situation, avoiding the negative self-talk, calling someone, reaching out for help. The reason that's so hard is because we feel like when we reach out for help, we're weak yeah. and it's weakness. Yeah. But nothing could be further from the truth. Reaching out for help is one of the most strong and, and sometimes difficult things to do, yeah. is the opposite of yeah. weakness. Um, you mentioned AA and support groups. There's lots of other support groups as well. Mm -hmm. I've always found in my practice, if AA is your thing, invest in it. If it's not, find another support group. Yeah. Don't use that as an excuse to not do the work. Totally, 100%. I love that you said yeah. that because not a lot of people are saying that That's too. Right. There's a lot of different support groups out there. Find the one that works for find you. Find the one that yeah. works for you. Absolutely. Having a sponsor or someone you can call at any time of any of the day uh, it can get you out of that situation. Sometimes... The risk of relapse is reduced significantly just because you've gone through all those steps and time has passed. Right. Right? Uh, a very good friend of mine that works in recovery still, she has 25 years sober from alcoholism. She's shopping at Walmart, right? Got a cart full of stuff. She goes past the rubbing alcohol. Hmm. Trigger, right? Wow. 25 years sober, AA yeah. gal. She knows what's going on. Yeah. Leaves her cart in the middle of the shopping aisle leaves the store, calls her sponsor, and goes to a meeting. Wow. Tw you know what I mean? 25 okay. years later, that yeah. was just so ingrained in her yeah. that she knew at that moment that she needed to do Yeah, something. I love that story. That's you don't, great. You don't, yeah. you don't get there on day one or day two, but yeah. with repeated practice and consistency, That's you, right. you can do it. Yeah. So thank you so much for those tips. Yeah, um, my pleasure. So yeah. I'm, I'm really curious, um, any upcoming film, TV shows, future goals? What are you working on these days? Yeah, I know. That's like the million dollar question. So um, I don't know, uh, you know, the acting thing. It's I, I, I think it's going to come when it's ready. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I'm kind of like a, a failure to launch kid, but in a good way, right? Like I just grew up in my 30s. Mm -hmm. I just turned 40 and now I'm ready to like take on the world again. Good. I really am. So I, I believe that that is all going to happen for me um, in God's time, mm -hmm. which is cool. Uh, what I am doing, I've been writing my memoir for the last year and a half. Excellent. Started it during COVID. Um, along with gaining the 40 pounds. So I was just like <laughs> eating and writing and I have a co-author. Um, her name's Madison and yeah, we're excited. We're almost done. Great. So we're going to start shopping it. And, um, yeah, I mean, other than that, you can find me on Instagram. It's at Natanya Ross and, um, I'm pretty active on there. So you can see like what city I'm going to be in next signing autographs Great. or meet and greets and all of that kind of stuff. Great. And then also helping struggling addicts get into treatment to the best of my ability. When the book comes out, I would love to have you back on the show I'll be to, here. to plug it, to talk about I'll it. I'll be here. Okay. Yes, Excellent. I'll be here. Thank you again to Natanya for speaking on the Be Well program today. To our listeners and viewers, please like and subscribe to our channel to stay informed. You are not alone. A better tomorrow is real. Until next time, I'm Dr. Bender. Be well.